on World News Tonight. Omicron spreads. The EU struggles with new infection surges driven by the variant of concern. Vaccine mandates. Heavy blows dealt to free movement as the government mulls jab necessity. Behind bars. Peace icon now turned convict yet again as Myanmar jails Aung San Suu Kyi. Slaying Santa. Diving, skiing and much more carried out in honor of the Christmas spirit. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with the COVID crisis. The Omicron variant of the coronavirus has spread to about one third of the United States and new travel restrictions for international air travelers coming into the U.S. are set to begin. All visitors must now show proof of a negative COVID test the day before boarding and some travelers are cancelling their flights altogether. Health officials on Sunday said the Omicron variant of the coronavirus has spread to about one-third of U.S. states. Well, the winter plan that the president announced actually had a number uh, of strong measures. But U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy sought to reassure the public that the Biden administration was prepared to confront the newest mutation of a global disease. The president announced were much stronger measures to expand our booster uh, campaign. We're going to have millions of reminders sent out to seniors, many more appointments set up by pharmacies and hundreds of family mm -hmm. clinics so kids and adults can get vaccinated together. There was also an expansion of testing, 50 million free tests that will be sent out, private insurance coverage for tests starting in January. And speaking on CNN, top U.S. infectious diseases expert Dr. Anthony Fauci reassured that when it comes to Omicron, quote, thus far, it does not look like there's a great degree of severity to it. But he added that it was too early to draw definitive conclusions and that more study is needed. It's too early to say that. Former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb agreed it was too early to say how dangerous Omicron may be, in part because most of the data out of South Africa is from Omicron cases in people who already survived the Delta variant. We don't know whether or not this new strain is inherently um, less virulent, so it's a, a more moderate strain of COVID. It's not causing as severe illness or whether it's presenting that way simply because it's infecting people who already have some pre-existing immunity. So they have some protection from COVID, so they're getting infected, but they're not getting as sick. Many of the cases in the U.S. so far were among fully vaccinated individuals with mild symptoms, although the booster shot status of some patients was not reported. According to a Reuters tally, the U.S. over the last seven days has averaged 119,000 new coronavirus cases a day. Over that same period, the virus has killed almost 1,300 people per day. As Omicron raises global concerns about a surge in infection, some countries like Israel and Brazil are accelerating their booster rollouts, with some even reviewing the possibility of authorizing a fourth shot of the vaccine. This comes as over 180 Omicron cases have been identified across Europe. As concerns rise over the rapid spread of the Omicron variant of COVID-19, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control says 182 cases have been identified across the EU plus Norway and Iceland. As of Sunday, it added the new variant has been reported in 17 of the countries it serves. The ECDC explained the majority of the cases are in people that have a history of traveling to Africa, but noted there is evidence in several European countries, such as Germany and Spain, which shows undetected community transmission could be ongoing there. It says all cases for which there is available information on severity were either asymptomatic or mild, adding no deaths have been reported so far. Israel says it's molding the possibility of authorizing a fourth COVID-19 booster shot to those with weak immune systems. In July, those undergoing cancer treatment in Israel were the first to receive a third shot. Saying the health authorities are due to discuss a fourth dose this week, local media outlets say officials are concerned about the spread of the Omicron variant. Brazil is also accelerating its rollout of booster shots in an attempt to contain the spread of the new strain. The Sao Paulo state government says it will shorten the interval for a third dose to four months from the previous five. Six cases of Omicron have been reported in Brazil, with all of them having recently returned from Africa. 
Europe's biggest economy, Germany, is edging closer to imposing controversial mandatory vaccination. And the move is making waves in a country where a significant session of society has resisted to getting a COVID-19 shot. For more on this, we have Abhijan a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponza reporting from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Shanali. According to a copy of draft legislation, the incoming German government wants to make COVID-19 vaccinations mandatory for people working in hospitals, nursing homes and other medical practices. Germany has been reticent about making vaccines compulsory for fear of accelerating a shortage of medical and nursing home staff. But support has grown for the idea as the country has faced surging infections in a fourth wave of the pandemic. The Social Democrats, Greens and Free Democrats, which are set to form the new German government, are set to present the legislation to Parliament in the coming week. The draft said staff working in these areas would have to prove that they are vaccinated or recovered from COVID-19 or present a medical certificate to show they cannot be vaccinated by a specific date. The proposed legislation extends until February 15 the temporary measures that would allow Germany's federal states to introduce more drastic lockdown measures if needed. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Abdul Darren World News Special Correspondent Inu Kaponza reporting from Cleve in Germany. New information about the Omicron variant continues to be uncovered, and scientists say that the newest strain may harbor a snippet of the common cold virus as well. The Omicron variant may have a smidgen of the common cold virus attached to it, according to a new study. Scientists from Cambridge, Massachusetts-based data analytics firm Enference have attempted to bring more clarity to this newly emerged variant that experts around the world are currently scrambling to find answers to. They found that the Omicron variant may have picked up a morsel of the common cold virus in its mutation. This could potentially mean that the virus could transmit more easily and be more evasive to human immune response, while also displaying mild cold-like symptoms. But experts say that it's too early to write off the Omicron variant as completely innocuous. The virus so far has been detected in at least 38 countries, spreading like wildfire in 23 more countries in just two days. The strain has also been found in one-third of U.S. states already, according to local health officials. Early data suggests that Omicron is more contagious than Delta, and some say that it has the potential to upend Delta as a dominant strain. The World Health Organization says that the severity and the full impact of this virus strain will only become clear as time passes. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Outstood Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi has been sentenced to four years in prison, the first in a series of verdicts that could jail her for life. A Myanmar court has sentenced Aung San Suu Kyi to four years in jail. The deposed leader was charged with incitement and breaching COVID-19 restrictions, according to a source. President Win Mint was handed the same sentence. Critics are dismissing the case as a farce. Amnesty International said the charges against Suu Kyi were bogus and described the jail sentence as the latest example of the military's determination to eliminate all opposition. The two leaders have been detained since the February military coup. The country has been in turmoil since then, paralysed by protests and a deadly crackdown on the junta's opponents. Suu Kyi faces a dozen court cases that include charges of corruption and violating state secrets. The maximum sentences would mean more than 100 years in prison combined. Suu Kyi's supporters say the legal trouble is aimed at ending her political career while the military consolidates power. The military, however, has previously said that Suu Kyi is being given due process in an independent court, led by a judge appointed by her own administration. The trial has been closed to the media, and her lawyers have been barred from communicating with the media and public. The military has not disclosed where Suu Kyi is being detained. Tensions run higher than ever as U.S. President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin prepare for talks over video call regarding the relationship between two of the most powerful global leaders in relation to Ukraine. 
U.S. President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin will hold a video call Tuesday to deal with military tensions over Ukraine, as well as other topics. According to a U.S. source on Saturday, Biden wants to discuss U.S. concerns about Russia's military buildup on the Ukraine border, as well as strategic stability, cyber, and regional issues. The Kremlin said the two will also talk about bilateral ties and the implementation of agreements reached at their Geneva summit in June. More than 94,000 Russian troops are massed near Ukraine's borders. The Ukraine defense minister Oleksiy Reznikov said on Friday that Moscow may be planning a large-scale military offensive by the end of January, citing intelligence reports. Biden on Friday said he and his advisors are preparing a comprehensive set of initiatives aimed at deterring Putin from an invasion. He did not give further details, but the Biden administration has discussed partnering with European allies to impose more sanctions on Russia. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told Next Summit that Biden was determined to stand against any aggression against an ally. The exact timing of the call between Biden and Putin was not disclosed. France and Saudi Arabia agreed to do more help to the Lebanese population, work to solving a diplomatic rule between Beirut and the Gulf states, and jointly push to get the government there running. In the last leg of his Middle East visit, French President Emmanuel Macron was in Saudi Arabia where he met with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who, according to a CIA report, ordered the killing of journalist Jamal al Khashoggi. Macron alluded to the writer's fate while avoiding all mention of his name. The president also announced that Paris and Riyadh will work together to open up the country and turn Saudi Arabia into a tourism hotspot, as well as work together to help Lebanon out of its ongoing political and economic crisis. On Friday, Macron visited the United Arab Emirates, where he signed a 14 billion euro arms deal, a move criticised by Human Rights Watch, who warned that the Emirates was involved in the Yemen conflict, which has left 5 million Yemenis facing famine. It's also a move analysts warn could isolate France in the long term. France is obviously trying to redevelop its image as well as its position on the world stage and uh, doing so in the Middle East and North Africa without actually uh, cherishing uh, values and, and human rights, which kind of undermines France's position in the wider international community. Macron was also in Qatar on Saturday, where he thanked the country for helping with the evacuation of 250 threatened Afghans to France. Pope Francis met refugees during his second visit to the Greek island of Lesbos, a main entry point to the migrants that has become a symbol of the plight of refugees. The Pope coming today, it's something that it's giving all the refugees, uh, it's making all the refugees to be happy because they know that the main time we are here, but there is someone who think about us and he came to visit us and not only like hearing it from far, you were listening to Joshua, 18 years old from the Congo, explaining his joy that Pope Francis was visiting the Greek island of Lesbos on Sunday, the troubled island on the front line of Europe's migrant crisis and where Joshua has been living for a year in a refugee camp. This is Pope Francis's second visit to the island of Lesbos, one of the main landing areas for years for migrants trying to cross the treacherous sea into Europe, many dying in the process from countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and parts of Africa. It's also been a major burden for the local residents. The Pope here is saying their eyes have seen violence and poverty, eyes streaked by too many tears, and later that little has changed since his last visit five years ago. Governments and citizens need to attack the root causes that drive people from their homelands, Pope Francis says, not the people who suffer for it. Landred, 42 years old and from Cameroon, hoped to meet the Pope. It was a dream. My really message was, it was just to ask him to try to look for a funny way with Greek government, also with the European Union government, to make the asylum process be more flexible. Pope Francis said he was distressed by calls from some EU leaders to build more walls.
The eruption of Indonesia's Semeru volcano killed at least 14 people and injured dozens. With a few spades and bare hands, rescuers dug up three bodies buried underneath blankets of volcanic ash. Indonesia's Mount Semeru volcano continued to smolder on Sunday after its deadly eruption the day before. Mount Semeru, the tallest mountain on Java Island, threw up towers of ash and hot clouds on Saturday, blanketing nearby villages in East Java province. Video obtained by Reuters showed fallen trees and roads covered with thick mud, while authorities said the eruption severed a nearby strategic bridge. Local media reported that some rescue efforts were suspended by the destruction. But the country's disaster mitigation agency said hundreds had already been evacuated to safety. Scores were injured, including two pregnant women. Authorities said that most of the injuries were burns. Indonesia's transport ministry said on Sunday, however, that the eruption caused no disruption to flights, though pilots have been alerted to watch out for ashfall. Semeru is one of Indonesia's nearly 130 active volcanoes. It last erupted in January with no casualties. Indonesia sits on what's known as the Pacific Ring of Fire, a region where earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are common. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Bob Dole, who overcame grievous World War II combat wounds to become a preeminent figure in the U.S. politics as a longtime Republican senator from Kansas and his party's unsuccessful 1996 presidential nominee, died on Sunday at age 98. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida vowed to ensure workers' wages hikes to protect the economy from rising global inflation while strengthening the country's defenses as it deals with an assertive China and unprecedented North Korea. Thailand has detected its first case of the Omicron coronavirus variant in a U.S. citizen who had traveled to the country from Spain late last month. The confirmed case in the man makes Thailand the 47th country to have found the new variant. Shares of China Evergrande Group tumbled 12% to an 11-year row after the firm said there was no guarantee it would have enough funds to meet debt repayments prompting Chinese authorities to summon its chairman. A solar eclipse brought a rare darkness to western Antarctica. The region sees constant daylight from October to April. The sun, moon and earth were in one direct line and sunlight was completely blocked by the moon for a few minutes. Supporters of French far-right presidential candidate Eric Zemmour threw punches and chairs at several protesters wearing anti-racism t-shirts during his first political rally. James and Jennifer Crumbly are now behind bars after being captured and charged with four counts each of involuntary manslaughter. The school is releasing new details on what happened in hours leading to the shooting that killed four students. Tonight, the suspected high school shooter and his parents under close surveillance. All three of them, the son and both parents, they are segregated, each individually, in isolation. Uh, we have... Uh, advanced watch on them. James and Jennifer Crumbly joining their son in jail after being captured and charged Saturday with four counts each of involuntary manslaughter. The couple was arrested inside Andre Shakura's art studio early Saturday morning where police say they were hiding out. Sakura, a person of interest, speaking to NBC News through his attorney. Now the school releasing new details on what happened in the hours leading up to the shooting. A teacher discovering the suspect's disturbing drawing drawing of a person who appears to have been shot twice and bleeding. Below that figure is a drawing of a laughing emoji. The school says the incident was immediately reported to the school counselor, but that the suspect told them the drawing was part of a video game he was designing. His parents arrived for an emergency meeting and were told to put the teen in counseling within 48 hours. School officials say the parents refused to take their son home. After counselors determined the 15-year-old wasn't a threat, they sent him back to class. Hours later, the suspect allegedly opening fire in a packed hallway, killing four students. The impact of the latest tragedy on full display Saturday night. Can you please rise for a moment of silence as we honor the lives that were lost. The University of Michigan football team honoring the victims at the Big Ten Championship, paying special tribute to Oxford High School running back Tate Meir. And finally tonight, beat skiing or diving, Santa's got it covered this year as jolly groups have fun for a good cause.
The Jolly Scent Knicks took a break last year because of the global pandemic, but they returned to kick off the ski season in full holiday garb, including white beards, red hats and red outfits. The slopes and lifts at the Sunday River Resort were packed with revealers supporting Santa's signature red suit with white trim. This year's event raising over $4,000 for the River Fund, a charity organization that introduces young people to the benefits of outdoor recreation. Meanwhile, in an aquarium in Budapest set out to spread Christmas cheer for their four sharks, various fish and customers by dressing their divers as Santa. The divers also installed a small Christmas tree at the bottom of the 1.4 million litre aquarium and decorated it with shells. The four sharks and fish also received extra food for the holiday season. The Christmas tree stays in the aquarium until the end of the season keeping both fish and divers busy. In case you have missed any of the stories we add tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Anuradhi will be back tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.